we've, we've said most of the things I want to say about switching. We've introduced the three, three approaches, circuit switching, and then within packet switching, two approaches, datagram packet switching, virtual circuit packet, packet switching. So let's, let's finish and summarize in a bit of a comparison about the differences between them. Uh, circuit switching, we set up a connection or a circuit between, before we transfer data and then we transfer the data, commonly used in telephone networks. Similar in virtual circuit packet switching, we set up a connection or a call at the start and then send the data, but now we send packets. And in datagram packet switching, we just send the packets. We don't set up some connection at the start. <coughs> circuit switching, let's, let's compare them and, and think about the advantages of circuit and packet switching. What benefits does sending data as packets give us compared to just sending it uh, as one large chunk as in circuit switching? Uh, one of the key parts of circuit switching is that when we set up a connection, we reserve resources through the network. What resources? Well, think of on the links, the resource is the capacity. So we reserve some of that capacity for our source destination pair. So that's one resource reserve we, that we reserve. And another is on the nodes, the switching nodes themselves. The resources there are their, uh, their memory, their CPU, uh, so that when the data comes in, they, they allocate resources so that it's reserved for that particular source destination pair. So we reserve resources in circuit switching. And that's important and gives us a, a strong advantage in that because we've got many users sharing the network, when I set up my connection in circuit switching, I'm guaranteed to have those resources allocated for my data transfer. No one can take it away once the connection is set up. As long as the connection is set up, it's reserved and allocated for me. And we, I think we had an example yesterday, we said with voice calls, uh, so say one link between switching nodes supports a capacity of a hundred different, a hundred parallel voice calls. When I set up my connection, I reserve one, one unit of that capacity. Okay? So when 100 other people make voice calls using that same link, then we'd say that the capacity of that link is reached. So if 100 people reserve capacity for one voice call and the total support it supports is 100, then we've reserved the entire capacity. Even if I'm not talking on the phone, if I have the connection set up, if I'm not talking, not sending data, that capacity is still allocated for my call. No one can take it away, no one can use it, even if I'm not using it. And an analogy that uh, people use is road networks. Think about uh, driving People drive, we need to get people from A to B on the road in, in between two cities or two, two locations. Uh, and what happens here in Thailand and in other countries is when a, when a VIP needs to travel from A to B, what happens? You know, what happens? Someone important, member of the royal family, or some high-ranking politician needs to get from A to B. How, what happens on the roads? Sorry? They block the road, okay? That is, the, the police, uh, some organization in advance, they know that we need to get these people from A to B. What we do is we, we stop other people using that particular road so that they can travel from A to B with no stops, no traffic lights, uh, no other cars to slow down for. They just travel at a constant speed all the way along the road, okay? Think of... Uh, Let's say now, consider the road has multiple lanes, say three lanes. Let's say we do that, but just for a single lane. Okay, so the VIP gets one lane allocated for them. Okay, there are still two lanes for us people to use. We can use those two lanes to drive at any speed and go turn left and so on. But one of those lanes is reserved 
for the VIP to drive on. So this is the concept like circuit switching. That is, we've got this capacity available. We reserve a portion of that, say a, <coughs> a lane of the road, for one source destination pair, one set of users. And once that's reserved, no one can go into that lane. Even if they're, they're not using the lane at this point in time, okay, they've driven past already, with circuit switching, the idea is that no one else can use that lane, even if there are no cars in it. So it's good for those users because they get to drive from A to B with no stops. No other cars to slow them down. No, no red lights, somehow they, they bypass the lights as well. So they get from A to B with no delays along the way. The only delay is, depends upon the, the speed at which they can drive at and the distance, so the transmission and propagation delay. Even as they pass through the, the intersections, because the lights are set green for them, they just go straight through. So it's good from their perspective, but it's not good from the perspective of the road network because, or in some cases, if we reserve that lane for an entire day, 24 hours, okay, so the police in advance reserve that lane, they put some cones on the, there so no one can drive in that lane for 24 hours, and then the, the VIP drives along there, takes them, what, one hour to, to use that. For the remaining 23 hours of the day, no one can drive in that lane, and that's a waste of the road network. From the, other, from the perspective of the network, that lane is unused. That's very wasteful of the resources. And that's the trade-off that occurs in circuit switching. We reserve resources. In this case, we reserve the portion of the capacity of the links and allocate resources inside the switching nodes for data from A to B. That's good for the data transfer from A to B, they get guaranteed performance, but it's bad if they reserve those resources but don't use them, or only use them for a portion of the time. Because, because they're reserved, no one else can use them, and the utilization, we say, of the network, the amount that it's used, is not the maximum. We're inefficient. How do we overcome that with packet switching? Uh, now imagine, okay, with packet switching, virtual circuit packet switching on our roads. Imagine now we have our three lanes available. We have some intersections, some stoplights. Think of this, uh, what happens if um, there are many different paths to take. There, to get from A to B, you can turn left and go down a side road and come back. So there are different paths to take. With virtual circuit packet switching, in advance, the source sets up or decides the path they're going to take, and possibly, e possibly even in informs, let's say, the policeman standing at each intersection that we're about to drive from A to B via your three intersections. Okay? And what the policeman at each intersection could do is to give some, change the signals on the lights so that they get a green light to go through. But with packet switching, let's say now we don't have a whole lane to ourselves. Our packets are, are our cars. So there are multiple cars to get from A to B. On those three lanes of road, we still need to compete with the other cars on that road. Okay, the cars that are driving in front of us that slow us down. So there's still some delay there. And in fact, at each intersection, we may not always get a green light and we may have to wait for the cars that are going on the opposite direction and there will be delays at each intersection. So with packet switching, all right, the analogy to the road network, think of individual cars now need to share the road. We no longer have resources reserved for the entire path, which means that those cars don't get to travel at 120 kilometers an hour all the way through they have to slow down for intersections, they must slow down for other cars in their way. Okay? So that's packet switching. The, the packets go as fast as they can, but they may be uh, slowed down by other packets coming into switching nodes and sent across links. But the advantage comes with packet switching is because, okay, we're sending, we, uh, the, 
in the early morning, there are few cars on the road. Okay? And in that case, and then let's say a company wants to drive all their employees, so all the employees drive from SIT into the city on the road, then we can utilize that road for ourselves in that case. As more people want to drive on the road, what happens? Well, the road supports their cars and driving on those three lanes. The issue that arises now is that at each intersection, as people arrive at intersections, we start to get, what, some congestion. We start to get some delay because I arrive at an intersection, other people have arrived, so we must give way or wait, and there's some delay there. So our packets may be delayed, or our cars are delayed. But the benefit is that, okay, think of an intersection now. At some point in time, maybe there's a lot of cars coming from one direction, and few cars coming from the other direction. And they all go out on some output road, on, in some third direction. And we just let them all go out in the uh, third direction. At another time, there may be few cars coming from the first direction, but more cars coming from the second direction, because it's a different time of the day, different source. Uh, again, they're all sent out on the output direction. If we use the concept of circuit switching, we'd need to reserve a lane for the cars. With packet switching, we don't reserve any resources. We allow people to send their data at any time, and we share those resources amongst them. It's much more efficient when the amount that needs to be transferred, the number of people trying to drive on the road, varies over time. And sometimes there are a few packets being sent, we can send them out. And sometimes there are a few packets coming from this direction, many coming from this direction, we can still send them out because we combine them and send them out. The worst case is that there are many packets coming from one direction, many packets coming from the other direction, we can only send them out at some speed, and what happens is that the packets get sent eventually, but they get some delay waiting for those other ones. Let's try and show that. Uh, with an example you don't have, but we'll, uh, I'll make it available later, but just watch and, and, and see uh, a comparison between circuit switching and virtual circuit packet switching, and later we'll talk about datagram packet switching. First, a network. Squares are stations wanting to send data and receive data. Circles are um, switching nodes. Let's focus on the top. This is the source, this is the destination. Let's just focus on this part via the, the two central switching nodes. So, for our example, we want to send data from here to here using circuit switching first. Before we can send the data, we establish a circuit or a connection. So we send a special message from source to the first switching node saying, I want to connect to this destination. The switching node receives that message and records in, in, in the switch some information saying there's potentially going to be a connection, a circuit from here to here. So we record some information. We keep sending that on to the next switch. This is what we call a uh, different names for it. There's a, a circuit request or a connection request message. We're trying to request to set up a circuit. We send it through to the destination. When the destination receives it, it responds with a response, an accept or response message saying, I accept your connection. This is like the process of uh, someone picking up the phone. You call them, when they pick up the phone, it sends back a response message. And as the response comes back, this confirms the connection or circuit needs to be set up. So the switch is now confirmed, and inside the switch, they connect this line, this input line, with this output line. Remember our network has multiple lines coming in. I've just hidden the other links. But because of this circuit setup, we now, from the switch's perspective, connect Anything that comes in from this link is going to be sent out on this link. And anything that comes into the second switch on this link send, is sent out here, if it's belonging to this pair of stations. That's the connection setup. 
or circuit setup. And we saw the picture of the operators. The way they do that in the old style was that the lines were your telephone lines and what they do is just essentially just connect them together with a, a separate cable in the telephone exchange. Now it's just done in uh, electronics. <clears throat> so we've set up a circuit. Now with circuit switching we just send the data. And the, the best way to think of it is that we now have a link from source all the way through to destination. Because we have a link to this first switching node and that has in some, some logic inside here a link to this output line which links to the second switch, switching node which links in here. So this link is really just some, some electronics inside the, the switching node. So if we transmit a signal from the source the idea is that signal will travel along this line through the switching node along this line, through the second switching node, and arrive here. As if we have one long long cable from source to destination. So here we represent the data being transmitted. We start transmitting some data. It comes out of the source, transmitted along the link to the first switching node. When the first switching node receives it, it simply passes it through to the second output link. Think of the data goes through the switch. Very little processing in circuit switching. It's just some electronics to say anything coming in here goes out here. And it passes through to the destination. And the destination receives the data. Resources were reserved along by the switching nodes for this data transfer. If we've set up this connection, we've transferred our data, the connection is still set up, no one else can re use the resources available. They are reserved just for this pair of source destination. No one else can make use of the spare capacity. Let's look at virtual circuit packet switching. Same setup. Virt virtual circuit packet switching, we try to be like circuit switching. We set up a connection first, so it's a similar procedure. We send a special packet and we respond saying, yes, I accept your connection. And the result is that we've informed these switching nodes that there's going to be some data transfer from the source to destination. I've drawn it a little bit different here because the way that it's implemented is that uh, now we're going to send packets. What each switching node will do when it receives a packet, it will look in the header. Inside of the header packet will be the source and destination. And what the switching node did when we set up the connection is it made note. Any packet coming from this source going to this destination if I receive it, I'm going to send it out on this line. There's no reservation of resources. It's just telling the switch, if you receive from this source, send it out here. And the second switch, if you receive from this source to this destination, send out here. So we now send our data. But now we're sending it as separate packets. We don't, if we have a, a large file to send, we break it into multiple packets and send those packets one at a time. Not shown here, but the packets will have some header information, not just the data. The circuit switching, there was just data, no header needed. <coughs> Let's consider a slight variation where, okay, the data that wants to be sent from source to destination uh, Sometimes we have some data to send, sometimes we don't. So we don't continuously send packets. Let's say I send a packet and then a few milliseconds later I send a second packet. And then I send nothing and then a bit later I send more. Okay, so we don't have to always send packets. 
continuously. And that's what I've tried to illustrate here. There's a bit of a gap between the sending of the subsequent packets. I transmit packet 1, maybe 2 milliseconds later I transmit packet 2, and then a few milliseconds later packet 3. It depends upon the application. Do we have a lot of data to send, or maybe we have some and then nothing to send? We'll see why that's relevant later. The packets arrive at the circuit switch. This circuit switch looks at the header of the packet, determines from the connection set up, I need to send it out here. Importantly, there's some, compared to circuit switching, there's some significant processing here. There's some processing delay of the packet. The, the switch needs to read the header, read the entire packet normally, determine where to send it, and then send. So there's some delay for the packet in here. Depends upon the packet size. It also depends upon how fast the switch can process the packet. But importantly, and not shown very well in here, but remember there are other links coming in here. So at the same time, there may be other packets coming into this switch. So the time it takes to process this one and send it out depends upon how many other packets are coming in at the same time from other sources and destinations. So there may be some significant delay for this packet and generally we refer to that as the queuing delay. It may have to wait while other packets are being processed and that queuing delay can be significant. We eventually send it out the other packets come in, we send them out one at a time, and we deliver those packets. But because there's some varying delay, there may be some delay to send them out, you see that the, there's a bit of a, a gap between when the first one was sent and the second one was sent. There's some space here. We could think that from the perspective of this link, we're, we're not 100% efficient because we're sending a packet, and then we're sending nothing for some time, and then we send the second packet, and then nothing, and then the third packet. So for some period of time, when we're sending data across this link, well, some, we're sending data sometimes, other times sending nothing. So we're not fully using the link. So we're inefficient in that case. and we deliver the packets on. Now let's come to a case where we now have a second source sending to another destination. This one at the top sending packets across this red line to the destination here. We've set up a circuit already. I won't show that process. We've set up two circuits. This one has some data to send here, some red packets we'll see, and we have our original blue packets to send as well. What happens? Two packets are sent, then this one starts sending packets, so packets start arriving at this switching node. And as they arrive, the switching node processes them, and in this case they all need to go across this link, because both paths traverse this link. And in fact, this is where we can get an advantage of, of packet switching. When there was just the blue packets to be sent across this link, we were inefficient because we weren't sending all the time. But now that we have a total of five packets coming into the switch and all need to be sent across this link, what we could do is send them one at a time similar to this. We send, okay, the first blue packet, there's a small gap, maybe before the red one arrived, then we send one of the red ones, then a blue one, a red one, and a blue one. That is all of those five packets that come in are sent across that link. You see there's fewer gaps between the packets, or in other words, there's uh, fewer times when we're not transmitting on this link. We're more efficiently using the link. We're sending all the time. If we have a link, we want to use it to its full capacity. If we don't, we're inefficient. So here's where an advantage of packet switching comes in because what is often the case is sometimes one node has many packets to send and others have few packets to send. 
So we can take advantage of that by sort of combining them and sending them one at a time from different sources across the same link. We got that advantage here. What if there was another circuit, virtual circuit, going in this path? Maybe we had some orange packets coming here, 10 orange packets coming in. What do you think would happen at this switch? We had three blue ones coming in here, two red ones here, and maybe 10 orange ones coming in here, all at the same time, or a similar time. What happens when we send the packets out? Are we going to fully utilize the output link? That is, we've got a lot coming in. Maybe we've got capacity to send, I don't know, six packets out within some time period. We should get full utilization of this output link because if we have, let's say we can send six packets out per second, we give some number, and we've got many packets coming in, then we keep sending packets out. So utilization or efficiency will be high still because we've got many packets coming in, we can send them out and always be transmitting on this link. So efficiency is good in that perspective. But the bad thing may be if you have many packets coming in and only few coming out, those ones coming in may have to wait before they get sent out. There'll be some queuing delay. Uh, that's what you see on roads at intersections. This is an intersection, some traffic lights. There's a lot of cars coming from this direction. A lot from this direction and a lot from this direction and they, most of them won't want to go down this direction. Well, from the perspective of this portion of the road, there'll be many cars on it. It'll be fully utilized. Okay, the road will be full because it'll be taking as many cars as possible. So that's a good thing in terms of we're utilizing the road. We're utilizing the link. So that's good. But the problem will be that the cars will start to line up here because there's cars from all three directions trying to go in this direction. We cannot fit them all on, so they'll have to line up and there'll be a queue of cars here and, and in each direction as they all try to go there. So you'll get this long delay waiting to be to go onto that output road or waiting for the packets to be sent. So the efficiency can be good, but if there's too much coming in, the delay goes up. That's the bad or potential bad thing for packet switching. With circuit switching, that's not an issue because the resources are reserved in advance. We know exactly how much is coming in and how much we can send out. Any questions? And the last, okay, and then we send those packets. And this switch determines, okay, the red ones go in this direction, the blue ones here, and they're received. Okay, and done. So this shows an example of trying to illustrate with packet switching, we can increase the efficiency of using the links. That's the advantage. We don't waste unused capacity. Because we can send other people's packets across that link if, if one, one user is not using it. With circuit switching, it can be very inefficient if we don't use that capacity, if we don't use what we reserved. But with packet switching, the delay may go up if there's many people sending. With circuit switching, performance is guaranteed. You get what you reserve. Yep. Yeah. I. How did I? Uh, why did I choose blue, red, blue, red, blue? Well, I just randomly chose and I drew them like that. Okay. Uh, what would happen is normally, the first packet that comes in would be the first one that goes out. Okay. So, if Packets are arriving in here. It's a first in, first out uh, queue. The first one in come, is the first one out. If two come in at the same time, then the the packet switch could just randomly choose one of them. But a, 
another way would be to give some packets priority over the others. Let's say red user paid a lot of money for their network connection. Blue user is just a normal user, paid the low cost uh, service which may mean that the switches treat the red packets with higher priority. So we'd see the red ones come out first and then the blue ones. Or the red ones were associated with voice, a voice call, voice over IP connection. The blue ones associated with web browsing. Normally with voice and video transfer, live interactive calls, we want to give high priority because they need to get to the destination faster. Okay, so they're things that we can do to give priority, but we're not going to try and explain that any further. Any other questions before we go back to our lectures? <clears throat> Let's finish off with a comparison. Uh, This one compares those three switching techniques from the perspective of how long it takes to get the data from source to destination. Circuit switching, virtual circuit packet switching, datagram packet switching. And across three links in, in this example. With the first two, we see we need to set up a connection. We send some special request message and then some accept or response comes back. Also with virtual circuit packet switching. Send a request packet, get some accept or response packet back saying, yes, let's start the data transfer. That incurs some delay. Okay, as we see here, if this is time zero, it takes some time to get that packet there and get the accept back. That's not present in datagram packet switching. We don't set up a connection, we just send our data as packets. So there's no delay at the startup or setup here. Once we've set up a connection in the first two, we can send our data. This is the data transfer phase, data transfer, data transfer. First on the, the two packet switching techniques. The data transfer that is this period, are the same. Under the same conditions, we, we send the packets in the same manner. What we do is we create a packet, attach a header to the data, transmit that packet across the first link. Once the second node receives that packet, it looks at the packet, maybe some processing delay shown here, and then transmits it across the second link. And once that first packet is received, it looks, determines where to send it, transmits across the third link, and then that first packet is received by the destination. And in this example, we were able to transmit packet 2 across the first link, while packet 1 was being sent across the second link. So we can calculate the time it takes to deliver that data. It's exactly the same here. Importantly, the switching nodes need to receive the entire packet before they send it on. And there's often some small delay here. It's shown this small delay here of receive a packet, process, then send. So the time to complete this depends upon the data size, of course, but the header size, how many packets, and what processing delay is needed at each each intermediate node. <clears throat> but with circuit switching, with circuit switching, sorry, once we've set up a circuit, we take our data that we want to send, transmit it out of the source, and we think that that data goes across the first link through the first switching node, across the second link, and through the second switching node, and is received. The switching nodes don't need to process that data. You remember back to our picture, there's a link going, line going through those switching nodes, so the data just travels straight through it. 
There's almost zero processing delay. There is some, but it's almost zero. Effectively, the time to deliver the data from source to destination depends upon the transmission delay, that's this time, and the propagation delay across the path from here to here. The propagation delay of the path depends upon the propagation delay of the links in that path. If it takes one millisecond to propagate across each link, then it takes three milliseconds to propagate across the path, just the summation. There's no processing in the middle. So, with circuit switching, the data transfer with the same amount of data under the same conditions will always take less time than with packet switching. Because with packet switching we have extra header to send, that's an overhead, and we have to wait for the packet before sending it again. So circuit switching, the data transfer is always faster. But both circuit switching and virtual circuit packet switching have this setup which incurs an extra delay. So which one's best in terms of total delay? Or which one's worse? Or worse than another? Can you say anything about the three? Uh, and just, just to make it easier, this is disconnect. Saying we've finished the data transfer, disconnect. Let's forget about that and just focus on the time from the start from when we want to transmit data until the data is delivered. Well, what can we say? We can say datagram packet switching under the same conditions will always be faster than virtual circuit packet switching because the data transfer is the same, but virtual circuit packet switching also has call cool setup. So that's going to take a bit more time. Uh, we can say circuit switching will be faster than virtual circuit, virtual circuit packet switching because well, effectively we have the same call set up. There may be some details in the, uh, that are different, but we have to set up the call. The data transfer is faster with circuit switching than packet switching. What about between circuit switching on the left and datagram packet switching on the right? Which one's better or which one's faster? or under what conditions would one be faster than another? <clears throat> the the trade-offs are circuit switching, we must set up, then transfer data. So the disadvantage is the setup time. With packet switching, a datagram packet switching, no setup time, but we have a disadvantage of having to send headers for every packet, and that we must wait for a packet before we send it on. That is, we have this processing time in the intermediate devices. We cannot say one is always better than another. Okay? We cannot. It depends upon the conditions. Generally, if we have a lot of data, so we, if we increase the amount of data that we have, then circuit switching will be better than datagram packet switching or faster, at least less time. Because with a large amount of data, the call setup becomes just a small percentage of the total time. The data transfer is the large proportion of the time. With a large amount of data, we need many packets, and every packet has a header. So, and, and we need some processing, so there's some extra delay with the data transfer. So with a large amount of data, doing a call setup is not so bad. But with a small amount of data, doing a call setup and then sending the data is usually bad for performance. That is, we have a large delay because it's better just to send the data immediately. Even if we have to send some header and do some processing of packets, we can finish our data transfer faster in that case. So there are some trade-offs between the, the timing or the, the time it takes to deliver the data 
in those three cases. To finish, we've got one more slide, but a rem reminder, circuit switching, telephone networks mainly used in, been around for a hundred years. Home telephone networks, uh, not, not in all mobile networks in some. The internet makes use of datagram packet switching, the internet protocol specifically. So in everything you do on the internet, you're using a form of datagram packet switching. It's very well suited. It's simple. There's no delay of setting up the connection. So when you visit a website, you just send the data and the web server sends back the data. There's no set up the connection and then send the data. Where's virtual circuit packet switching used? In some wide area network technologies, inside, say, an ISP's network or inside a campus network, it's used for some cases. This table summarizes some trade offs. Some of them we haven't discussed. You can read through. Let's just pick out the main ones. Uh, some are obvious. Let's go to. This is an, some important ones. <clears throat> um, the second one, okay. Circuit switching, we just send the data. Packet switching, we transmit packets, and there's some overhead of headers. Circuit switching and virtual circuit packet switching, there's some call setup delay. In circuit switching, once we've set up the, delay, the, the call, inside the switching nodes, there's very small delay. Okay, the data just goes straight through. But with both of the packet switching techniques, there's some delay of transmitting each packet. That's the, the negative. In where are we? The second to last one says fixed bandwidth. Maybe read that as fixed uh, fixed assignment of resources, reserved resources. So with circuit switching, we reserve some resources. Bandwidth is referring to the capacity of the links, but we reserve some resources, and it's fixed. But with packet switching. If we dynamically use those resources. So what are the adv advantages and disadvantages? By having a fixed set of resources, we guarantee the performance, but it can be an inefficient if we don't use the resources. Dynamic use of resources is more efficient because we use them whoever needs them, but it may lead to some extra delay with our packet switching. Uh, and that comes back to this one in the middle. If there's a lot of people sending data, we start to overload the network. What happens? In circuit switching, we will block the next call. We said that yesterday, that uh, our network can support 100 voice calls at any one time. The 101st person who tries to make a call will not be able to set up and make a call. They'll be blocked. That's the outcome. Whereas with the packet switching techniques, what normally happens is that we still get to send our data. We're not blocked from sending data, but the delay of the packets being delivered to the destination goes up. And that's the negative there. So the, the data eventually gets through, but it just takes more time. And I think they're the main ones to pick out from that uh, set of uh, a comparison of the techniques. In the last 30 minutes or so, we'll move on to the next topic. Before we do so, any questions on switching? We've omitted many details, that is, we haven't gone into much detail of how they work, but we've tried to introduce the concepts.
we saw with switching what we do in a, in a communications network now, we have to, we want to send data from source to destination, we need to go via some path, some multiple links. But we saw at the start that usually we have multiple paths to choose from. And we said that, well, we choose a path and then send data using one of the switching techniques. Now we need to go back and see, well, how do we choose a path? How do we choose a good path between source and destination? The topic being routing. And again, we can give an, anal an analogy which uh, is in road networks when you're driving your car. How do you you want to drive today after the lecture, drive into the, go shopping at Paragon or somewhere. Which way do you drive when you come leave Bunker D? Which road do you take or which roads, which path do you take? Anyone have an idea? Okay, uh, and then, then on the tollway, so you go on the tollway uh, via Rungsit. Uh, are there other paths? Are there other ways to drive? There's another tollway, so effectively from the north there are two tollways, okay, uh, the Changwatana one. Um, of course you don't have to go on a tollway, so there are many paths to take to drive into the same destination. Uh, how would you choose a path? How do you choose which way to go? What would you consider? Traffic jams, what, do you want to go to traffic jams? No, you want to avoid traffic jams, avoid congestion, okay. What else? Distance, okay. Don't drive 100 kilometers north and go out and then come down and make a 300 kilometer trip. Consider the distance, try and find the shortest in terms of distance. Anything else? Sorry? The speed, okay. Some roads allow you to drive faster than others, like the tollway or the expressway, for example. So if you use that, even though the distance may be longer, the time it takes you to get there may be shorter. Okay. What else? Anything else? What if you don't want to spend money on a tollway? Okay. Avoid the tollways because you want to save some money for something else. All right, on once off, not a problem, but every day. So some financial cost. You may make a decision based upon the financial cost of using that road. So there are different criteria for choosing the best path to drive from A to B. Same in communication networks. We need to choose a path to get our data from source to destination via different switching nodes. There are multiple paths. Choose the best path, but there are different criteria for defining what is best. Distance, financial cost, delay, so we'll look at some of them. Uh, let's show, still on the road network, here's a grab from Google Maps to drive into Paragon from here, our campus. So Google determined a path for me. In fact, we'll see it determined several paths. Here's the path, one path, Just don't worry about the details, to get from A to B. <clears throat> it records, when I select that path, it says the distance, 31.4 kilometers. So it's calculated of each of those segments of road, how long it is, not so hard, and just add them up and you get the distance. It's got a, what a, a typical time, 30 minutes most likely calculated from, I'm just guessing really, most likely calculated from uh, knowledge of how long, how, the distance of each segment, the speeds that you can travel on each segment, and maybe some typical past data for the last six months or so on. So it works out that typically it takes 30 minutes to drive on this path. But it gives me another 
piece of information. I did this about 8 a.m. this morning, and it said in the current traffic, it'll take 46 minutes. How did it determine that? So what's the difference of it, right? Typical time, 30 minutes. Current traffic, 46 minutes. Well, again, I don't know exactly how Google does it, but they collected some information about the current road condition, condi conditions, the congestion, the traffic jams. Maybe there's a traffic jam in a particular location, and somehow they've collected information about well, what's happening in the last 10 minutes, the last 30 minutes, the last one hour, and from that, their algorithm determines, okay, if you drive now, it's going to take you 46 minutes, not 30 minutes. And, in fact, the, it gave me three options. The second option, 32.6 kilometers, another path, 36 minutes typical, one hour, five minutes. Now, current traffic. 39.5 kilometers, 39 minutes typical, 56 minutes now. So, another thing that's important, of course, we see different criteria. If I choose based upon distance, all right, in this case, we're going to choose the same one. I think distance, I'll choose the first one. Current time, I'll choose the first one. But comparing the, the second option and the third one, the third one has a longer distance than the second, but a shorter time in the current traffic. So it differs depending upon the criteria that we select. So we need to define best based upon uh, some selected criteria. But the other thing that's important here is that, okay, Google has calculated in current traffic the time. So somehow it's got some updates. Where would it maybe get updates from? How does it know what the current traffic is? Well, this is Google Maps. Go okay, so everyone with their Android device has some information going back to the Google servers, and from that they're getting information about, well, different things. Where the concentration of people are in cars, maybe the motion of cars, uh, maybe if they're running some application it could be reporting back, so where people are connected, so they're working out. Uh, there's a lot of people here, it's slow moving, maybe that means congestion, there's a traffic jam there. That means they can update the current traffic. Another potential source may be um, maybe not with Google, but with other systems, the, the traffic center for the city. Okay, there's, a, there's cameras on many roads, they get feedback on traffic jams. We could take that information and use it to update our calculation of the time it takes. Importantly, so there's two factors there. You need some source of information so that you can make an accurate decision. If I Okay, if I use the time of 30 minutes, 36, and 39 minutes, and I chose the least time, I'd choose the first path. But maybe there's a traffic jam on the first path, and the road's closed, and there's an extra one hour delay. So this one's up to, what, one hour 30 or, or larger. Then, I, of course, I shouldn't choose the first path, I should choose one of the others, which would take me less time. So important for me to make that correct decision I need to, or the network needs to get some information about what the current conditions are, where the traffic jams are, and it needs to get it on a regular basis. So where do we get the information from and how often we get it is, an important, is important in determining what the chances are we'll choose the best path. The more frequent we get updates from the more sources, the more chance we'll choose a path which is optimal, which is the best path. So that's with road networks. The same applies with uh, the same applies with uh, communication networks. There was another one I thought. This one. All right. This is a fourth path. 
A different one, avoid toll. So this is one based upon financial cost. Of course, uh, if I wanted to be accurate, I could say, give me a road that costs less than 30 baht or costs less than 60 baht. That is, uh, consider that would um, omit roads which have a toll, a total toll larger than some amount. So we could be more accurate from that perspective. So let's return to our communication networks. This process of choosing the best path is called routing. Choosing the best path or choosing the best route. <coughs> And in our communication network, what's the best path from A to D? Anyone? Four, five, three. One, that's one path. If we said the criteria for best was the number of links we traverse, and I think four, five, three would be the best one in that case because, okay, uh, well the number of switching nodes we traverse, here we have three, here we have four, this one has four. So four, five, three is the shortest in terms of number of links. But what if I said we want to consider delay to send our data? And if I knew that the delay to send from four to five was very high, but the delay to send on this upper path was very low, then this upper path may be the best path. The best path depends upon the criteria we specify for what is best. Okay? There are many different factors. So, question, what path or route should be taken from source to destination? Well, answer, choose the best path. Well, what do we mean by best? And how do we choose that? We need usually some algorithm to calculate the best path, given we define best. Especially when we have large networks, so hundreds of, hundreds of nodes, not just a simple example of six nodes. Thousands of pa possible paths. And you know, I'm sure you know, what's an algorithm for choosing a path? Choosing a route? choosing a best path? What's an algorithm that you've studied in a previous class? I can't remember. Maybe Dr. Bunyarit taught it. In, or maybe someone else. I can't remember. Yeah, you remember? Shortest path routing. You would have heard of Dijkstra's algorithm for finding the shortest path route. Uh, maybe you covered others as well. Bellman Ford. So there are algorithms that given a network will calculate and always find what's the, we'll say, the, the, sh the least cost path, the best path. We're not going to study those algorithms. I'll assume you're experts in them. We won't need them for this course. We're going to, routing is needed in all of the switching networks, circuit and packet switching. Okay? We need to choose the path. We're just going to use packet switching as the examples from now on. So we need some algorithm to find a route or a path from A to B. What are some requirements on that algorithm? It needs to be correct. The algorithm takes as an input source and destination. As an output, it returns a path. A correct algorithm returns a path which takes us from A to B. An incorrect algorithm returns a path which takes us from A to C. Okay, It's almost obvious that, of course, we need an algorithm that produces a path which gets us to the destination that we asked for. If it doesn't, if Google Maps, we said we wanted to go to Paragon but sent us to uh, Chiang Mai, then of course that wouldn't be very useful for us. It needs to be correct. It needs to be simple because usually simplicity leads to something that's easy and cheap to implement. 
because we, sorry, we need to implement this on computing devices. We'd like an algorithm that is robust, which means that when things are not working in the network, it can still determine the best path. An example is that we find a path from, let's go back to our example, from A to D, which is 4, 5, 3, and then we discover over time that switching node 5 is having some problems. It's, it's, not, it's dropping many packets that come in. So a robust algorithm would allow us to adapt and maybe choose a better path. So we, we would like that as a requirement. But what we don't want is that, okay, we choose this path, start sending some packets, then our algorithm says that this path is slightly better, so we switch to this path, one, two, three, send packets along there, but then our algorithm says, oh no, now maybe four, seven, six, five, three is better. And small changes in the network call, cause rapid changes in the path that, that we choose. This is uh, some instability in the paths. That can be bad for some applications. Ha sending your data across different paths all the time may impact upon applications. So we want robustness, but we also want stability. We don't want too frequent changes in the paths. We want to choose the best paths. Okay. Optimal paths. Fairness is the issue that some routing algorithms may be such that it chooses a good path for one pair of nodes, but a very bad path for another pair of nodes. That would be unfair between the second pair of nodes. Unfair for them. A better algorithm would be to choose a path which is maybe okay for both sets of nodes. So there's this issue of, we don't want an algorithm that always gives short paths or low delay paths for some nodes and very high delay paths for other nodes. We want one that it treats all nodes equally. Efficiency. <coughs> we'll see that when we implement the algorithms, normally we need to collect information from other nodes and collect it on a regular basis. So that takes some transmission overhead because we, to collect the information, we need to send some data through the network and it may take some processing. So any routing approach that we use, we want to minimize those overheads. We want it to be efficient. Let's look at an example to define some terminology. The terminology here, using this example. <clears throat> six switching nodes, N1 through to N6. There may be stations attached, but for simplicity, we just look at the switching nodes. The arrows represent links. So a link is direct connection between a pair of nodes. There's a link from N1 to N4, a link from N4 to N5. A path is one or more links to get from one source to a destination. So a path from N1 to N6 is N1, N4, N5, N6. A path from N1 to N4 is N1, N4. A path may contain one or more links. And there may be, usually, is multiple paths between a pair of nodes. From N1 to N4, there are many paths. So just some terminology, a path is a set of links to get from source to destination. Uh, when we traverse a link, we say that's a hop. So to go from N1 to N6 via the path 1, 4, 5, 6, we go from N1 to N4, that's one hop. N4 to N5, a second hop, and to N6, three hops from N1 to N6 on that path. So a hop is a common uh, way to measure how many links we traverse to get from source to destination along some path. Our links have costs associated with them. And on this diagram, the costs are shown as the numbers next to the arrows. So the cost 
to send some data from N1 to N4 is one unit. To send from N1 to N2 is two units. And so on. These are costs. The costs are not financial costs. They don't have to be, at least. The cost is some generic cost. It depends upon what we define as the performance metric. If we care about delay, I want to choose the path from N1 to N6 with the lowest delay, then we could make the costs equal to the delay to send across that link. For example, 1 means 1 millisecond. 7, 7 milliseconds, and so on. <clears throat> but if we care about financial cost, then we can say that the cost to transmit data across that link. 1 bar per x bytes. 7 bar per x bytes, and so on. Or if we care about uh, throughput, then those cost values can reflect the throughput on those links. So when we say cost, we don't necessarily mean financial cost. It could be any factor. What do we miss? Topology? Ah, neighbor. <clears throat> a neighbor is a... And the neighbors of N1 are N2, N3, and N4. The nodes that we have direct connections to are our neighbors. N5 has three neighbors. N3 has one, two, three, four, five neighbors. So the neighbors are those that we can directly connect to. Also called adjacent nodes. Uh, the topology of a network is the arrangement of the nodes and links. So this is one topology. If we remove the links here, we get a different topology. If we add a node here and some links, then that's a third topology. So that's the arrangement of the nodes and links, the topology. The goal for routing is to choose the path from A to B, which gives us the least cost. Choose a path with the lowest cost. What's the least cost path from N1 to N4 in this example? Easy one, N1 to N4. It has a cost of 1. The cost of a path is the sum of the cost of the links. So what's the least cost path from N1 to N5? I think if you check, you'll see N1, N4, N5, and the cost of that path is 2. 1 plus 1, you just add up. N1 to N6? Least cost path? N1, N4, N5, N6 has a cost of 1 plus 1 plus 2 is 4. You can check the others. N6 to N1. You need to go and actually check most of the paths to see. It's not straightforward. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> note, some new things here. The cost of links may be different in each direction. One unit to send to four, seven units to send back to one. That's possible. Because the characteristics of the link may be different in each direction, or the financial cost may be different. So in general, the cost depends upon the direction. From N6 to N1, from N1 to N6 is 1, 4, 5, 6, but from N6 back to N1 is not necessarily the same path in reverse, and it's not in this case. Uh, I think if you look, what do we get? 6 to 5 to 4 is a cost of 4 plus 1 plus then to 2 is 6, plus 3 is 9. Is that right? 4 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 10. Cost of 10 in that case. Is there a lower cost path? 
6 to 3 to 1 is 8, plus 8 is 16. What about 6 to 5 to 3 to 2? Well, you need to check all those parts. And that's what Dijkstra's algorithm does for us. When we have a large network, we don't need to manually do it. We use some algorithm that will take this information as input and return the least cost path from a pair from source to destination. Dijkstra's algorithm actually returns the least cost path from N1 to every other node. Of course, we can then use that. So what we do now in a communications network, once we know the topology, we choose some performance metric like delay or financial cost, and we use that to allocate some generic costs to each link. We get a picture like this, and then we apply an algorithm like Dijkstra's al algorithm to find the least cost paths from nodes to other nodes. And then we use those paths. In the last five minutes, let's just introduce some other issues there. So to do that, we need what are the performance criteria and a few other questions need to be ans answered. <clears throat> First, performance criteria. Here are four examples. Common one in a network is the number of hops. Choose the path with the fewest hops. Okay? That's a common, easy uh, performance metric. Financial cost. Choose the path which is cheapest for us to send our data especially if we're sending data via different internet service providers. Not from an end user's perspective, but from a company's perspective, we may have different paths to reach a destination. We must pay to use their network. Someone pays. So there's some financial cost of using particular paths. So financial cost may be a factor. Delay. The time it takes to get a message across a particular link. We can use that to determine, okay, now find a path with the least cost delay. Throughput is another thing. I want to transfer a large amount of data from A to B. Give me a path which gives me the maximum throughput. So there are four common performance criteria. There are others. Okay? It depends upon what our requirements are as to which one we choose. We'll skip these two, we'll come back to them next week. Let's go to network information source. This is the current view of the network. But things change over time. So therefore the costs may change over time. Currently the, the view of the network is this. N1 calculates the least cost path to N6 being 1456 and has a cost of 4 units. Okay, so N1 to get to N6 goes via 4 and 5. But then five minutes later, the network's running. The costs change on some of the links. And this link from N5 to N6 goes from 2 up to 20. For whatever reason, that the cost changed. Maybe the delay along that link has changed because there's a lot of traffic across that link. What that means is if N1 is using its path 1, 4, 5, 6, it's using a suboptimal path. Because the cost of that path has gone from 4 up to 22. If this has changed to 20 here. And there are lower cost paths than 22 from N1 to N6. For example, N1 to 3 to 6 has a cost of 10, which is lower than 22. So if the conditions in the network change, we'd like to be able to adapt and choose the, the optimal path. Now, how does N1 know that the cost of this link has changed from 2 to 20? Well, there are different approaches. One approach is that on a regular basis, every node sends a message to every other node saying what its current cost of the link is. 
let's say every one minute, Node 5 sends a message to everyone else saying, the cost of my links are 1 and 1, 1 and 1, 2 and 4. Then it sends another message every one minute, it does so. And, and when this one changes to 20, it sends a message saying, the cost of my links are 1 and 1, 1 and 1, 20 and 4. When that message gets back to Node 1, now Node 1 knows this cost has gone up to 20, let's recalculate and choose a better path maybe whatever it is, the second best path. So, for that to work, we need to have nodes update information. So, where do we get this information from about the changes in the network? And how often do we get these updates? What is the source of information about the network? And what is the timing in which we perform updates? What triggers an update? And the, the general trade-off is that the more sources of information and the more frequent the updates, the more likely we'll choose the optimal path. If we don't receive any updates, then we'll likely choose suboptimal paths if things change. For example, if we didn't receive the update that that link had changed from 2 to 20, we'd be always using that suboptimal path. So we want to receive information from as many nodes as possible but and as frequently as possible. The problem though, the more information that's sent across the network and the more frequent it's sent creates some overhead because actually it needs to be sent across the network, some processing overhead and some transmission overhead. We want to minimize that. So there's a trade-off between Frequent updates from many nodes, good for optimal paths, but bad for efficiency because we need to send that information. What we'll do next week is look at some options, some trade-offs between and trade-offs between them. Let's stop there and continue that next week. <laughs>